You'll notice in your bulletins that it says that we're doing Psalm 124 for the first service. Um, I'm actually going to switch those because Psalm 13 is a little bit longer um, and Psalm 124 is a little bit shorter. Uh, So if you'll turn to Psalm 13 this morning, uh, this will be our text. And then if you'd also like to keep your thumb in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we'll be reading the first eight verses just to kind of um, serve as a backdrop for our text this morning, not that they are in any way associated. I just think it's a helpful example of what Psalm thir- the picture that Psalm 13 paints. Um, so we'll consider it through that lens. Psalm 13 is a lament, and part of me wishes that I was um, 60 years old preaching this because I'd have the wisdom of a 60-year-old man uh, and all the life experience of a 60-year-old man preaching, I think, what is an important aspect of the Christian life. Um, so Psalm 13 this morning, uh, if you will l- turn there, we are going to read, this is God's holy and inspired word. So let us listen with reverence and with awe. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And then 1 Samuel chapter 1, very briefly this morning. There was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord. On the day of Elkanah, on, on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you that we can consider this text this morning. Lord, we ask that you would bless it in the hearts of your people, that it would be faithful to um, both the intent of the author and, and to your intent as the, the hand that has inspired these texts for the nourishment uh, of your people. Father, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Lament, or lamentation, is, as one author puts it so, I think, helpfully, the brutally honest and confrontational expression of distress before God. Lament is uncensored communion with God, visceral worship where we learn to be honest, intimate, and humble before God. It is both an acknowledgement that things are not as they should be and an anguished wail beckoning beckoning the Lord to intervene with righteousness and with justice. I believe that lamentation is no foreigner to the mountains and valleys contained in the story of redemption. I also believe that lamentation is no stranger to the story of the Bible or the characters that strut across its pages. Now, despite the dominant role that lament plays in the life of faith in the scriptures, uh, as I was researching this, I found that the data indicates across the board in American churches, their uh, lament is just entirely absent. Now, of course, this is polling data collected from predominantly evangelical churches and from CCEF, which is the licensing company that uh, administers and handles all the, uh, you know, all the legal stuff behind music and 
necessary for our modern age. But CCEF data, this organization, showed that only three of the top 100 songs uh, in 2020 and 2019 were songs of lament. Now, I don't mean to bash them or bash the evangelical church, and I'm not saying that we have this problem or don't have this problem. I'm just saying that I think that lament is an essential piece of the life of Christian faith, and it seems to be absent from, at least generally speaking, the expression of God's people. And I think that's interesting because about 40% of the psalms are made up of lament. And this is, of course, alongside the various stories in the Bible that are steeped in lament, like the book of Lamentations, like Job, or like the opening of Habakkuk. That difference in representation tells me that we might have a serious problem. We're missing something that Scripture indicates is essential for the worship and expression of both the community of God's people as well as the individual. This is especially the case for those living in the world of sin with one foot in this age and one foot in the age that is to come. Scripture makes wonderful promises to those who are the children of God. I think on Romans 8.28... And yet, these promises aren't always met by our experience. So the lament is a cry issued up to God, wrestling with that reality. God, you promised to be near to us right here and right now to provide for me. How can that be in light of what I am enduring? And so in this cry, we get a window into the soul of the sufferer and the reality of life as it is until glory. It's a window that I don't think we normally get into the inner dialogue of faith between a faithful, suffering saint and the God in whom we believe. We get that dialogue here in Psalm 13 raw with no pretense of emotion, with no superficiality, uh, and no feigned confession of faith. It's not fake. It's not superficial. It's not surface level. It's just an exposed view of, a dissected view of an anguished sufferer. So in this psalm, we learn that the faithful saint may lament what feels like God's absence, and yet ultimately, the saint finds comfort and hope by the trust that he places in the covenant faithfulness of the Lord and in his saving acts. And I want to look at that in three ways this morning. The psalmist's confusion in verse 1 to 2, the psalmist's call in verse 3 to 4, and finally the psalmist's consolation in verse 5 to 6. So two verses each, confusion, call, consolation. Now, the psalm opens uh, with words that I think would shock most of us and that many of us would never really think about uh, letting slip from our own mouths. Where are you, God? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And I think our initial instinct is to think of this as a kind of uh, blasphemous statement. How could a man speak that to God? And I think the reason that we think this is because we misunderstand, misunderstand the context in which these words are issued forth. And I found there to be a helpful analogy, and that's to look at marriage. Now, I really wanted to use an example. I, I literally heard this last night, of the perfect example of this, and I can't. My parents asked me not to use them in sermon illustrations anymore. But vaguely speaking, so, so I have this on good authority. I've now seen evidence. I'm not speaking from my own personal experience in marriage. I'm speaking from my observation. I saw something like this happen last night. So a anyways, I was a little bit suspicious the first time I thought of this analogy of whether or not it was accurate. And then I was like, yes, it was right last night. So... Um, Imagine for a moment that you're, if, if, if you don't have a spouse, you can imagine too like me, but if you do have a spouse, you can imagine concretely. Imagine for a moment that your spouse comes to you and says, honey, where have you been? How long will you make me wait without coming to my aid and looking on me with loving kindness and compassion? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me and withhold your love and care from me? Now, I think initially, if I was receiving these words, and most of us, I think, we would respond with anger and indignance. We'd be insulted. We'd react probably defensively, asserting, 
I, I have been there for you. Look at how much I'm working. Then I come home, I do the dishes, I take out the trash, or perhaps your wife says, um, I listened when you asked me to listen, when you needed me to care for you. I have been loving you. What are you talking about? And we, we get defensive. But I want to suggest that whether or not those claims of abandonment and isolation from one spouse to another are true, in the context of a covenant, it's not a bad thing necessarily. This is the kind of outcry uh, that is actually indicative of covenant fidelity on the part of the lamenter, the one crying out. We would never expect, for example, the wicked king Ahaz or Jezebel to cry out to the Lord moments before they were met with swift judgment, questioning why the Lord was far from them. Similarly, we would never expect Gomer, Hosea's unfaithful and promiscuous wife, to come to Hosea and say to him, where have you been? I was waiting at home for you all day. You were out prophesying in the streets and I needed you at home. He actually comes home to an empty house. How dearly I think he would have wished to hear those words from his wife. The point is that only someone who is faithful to the covenant commitment cries out feeling far from the covenant partner. In the case of this psalm, it is the great king who has sworn his oath of grace with us, promising, promising to accomplish the conditions of the oath himself. Because he will fulfill the conditions, we get the promise that he will not only deliver us in the future, but keep us in the present. That's who the psalmist is crying out to. I thought this would be, I didn't plan this. This is beautiful. Luke chapter 1. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore, the oath of promise to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. That's all covenant of grace. So the cry then to God is not a blasphemous cry accusing God, but a call of faith asking the covenant partner to be nearer to us. What husband does not want his wife to want to be near to him? What wife does not want her husband to want to be near to her and desire his benevolent face toward her? It's a complicated way of saying, what spouse doesn't want their partner to look upon them? So it's actually a confession of fidelity to the covenant on the part of the one who laments, desiring greater closeness from the covenant partner. And it's therefore also a cry on account of the covenant to the other party to honor the covenant. And in this case, that cry on the count of the covenant is a covenant of promise. Now, within the context of the Mosaic covenant, we have to wrestle with the fact that it's operating under the covenant of grace with a works principle. Blessings were promised for obedience and curses for disobedience. So how can we assert that this person is righteous and has not justly merited whatever anguish that they are enduring? Well, I think we can say this because the retribution principle, this, this works principle under the Mosaic Covenant, does not hold perfectly true in each and every scenario. We don't want to succumb to or give in to overly simplistic explanations of suffering and the works principle that they operated under. Israel, despite being in the kingdom of God's own dwelling under this Mosaic covenant, still lived in a broken world. This was the case for Hannah. She is a righteous woman, suffering through the anguish of barrenness, wondering why God has turned his face from her and closed her womb. It would be the same for the faithful exiles who were returning home 
from a foreign land to Israel, suffering life as a broken kingdom during the same time that the Psalter was compiled. And I don't think we get what any of those, ex- what I, I don't get at least, what either of those experiences are like. I don't know what barrenness is like and the anguish that Hannah endured. I think the closest I can get to Israel's experience in exile is, at least in a spiritual sense, my pilgrimage home to that heavenly country, waiting for the kingdom. I think maybe on a series of unfortunate events, a series of orphans of no parents and no home and just want some sort of stability. Things don't always work the way that they're supposed to. Those orphans were wonderful kids. Hannah was a righteous woman, an upright woman. So it's not a one-to-one correspondence between suffering and wickedness. And now especially that is the case for us. Outside the Mosaic Covenant, outside this works principle made at Sinai, this rings even more true. Whatever anguish we endure as righteous people, It is not the result of the punishment or judgment for our sin. Because that was drank in full by Christ at Calvary. So this then brings up a very difficult question regarding the righteousness of God in allowing such things to happen to his people. If we're not under a works principle, if we're not, and instead we're under a covenant of promise and blessing, how then can we suffer and feel that God is far from us? We might as righteous, righteous saints under God's sworn oath of promise say things like, God, you promise to be near to me, to provide for me, for those that you love. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of God's children. So what's going on? I'm not seeing, I'm looking at the ash heap that I'm sitting on. I'm looking at the burned down house. I don't see what's good in this. So under this promise, we might search for an answer in the presence of suffering. We don't feel that God is near to us. And the wrong assumption to come to is that simply because God has not answered in ways that we can observe right now, right here, in this moment, he must not be near and is violating his promise. Or we might conclude, he isn't really sovereign and in control. He isn't ordaining all things. Or, he isn't really just. Those are the conclusions the sufferer comes to improperly. But it's certainly not the case. In fact, the cry to God to remember his covenant and turn his face toward us is part and parcel. This is why lament is so important. That call to the Lord God is part and parcel of the way through which he has ordained that he will answer your plight. Whatever you ask in my name. Moreover, the expression of the psalmist is not a statement of fact, but rather a statement of their perception of their experience in relation to God's presence. Feeling that the Lord is not near because we do not yet have an answer does not mean that God is not near to us and is not in the process of acting. In fact, we do have an answer. We just might not see how it's in accordance with his promise. God not only never fails to be near to his people in their affliction, but he also never has to ask, as I might have to ask my would-be wife, why she feels that I'm far from her. God never needs to ask why you feel that way. He knows every thought and inclination of your heart. And so this cry is transformed into a sort of legal lawsuit, a covenant lawsuit. The lamenter brings to God their anguish as a way for, to call God to remember his oath, his covenant of promise. And so you call upon him to honor the terms of his covenant by asking, where are you, Lord? Turn your face upon me. 
And in effect, what this is doing is recognizing that he is the only one who can see and he is the only one who can solve their dilemma that they are in effect asking him for a solution for. To call on the Lord and question his nearness and the hiddenness of his face is to call the Lord for help on the basis of his covenant. And we see this in the cry to the Lord of the heart, in the heart of the psalmist and what it feels like for God to be and appear far from us in our affliction. That he's the only one that can help. The first half of verse 2 questions, how long must one take counsel in his soul? So in light of the predicament that they are in, in light of the fact that he has not, been, not seen a solution, the psalmist has turned to his own counsel for a solution. He's admitting this to the Lord. Lord, I'm at the end of myself. This is what I've been doing. And we all know what this is like and how hard it is in the midst of these circumstances to trust in the Lord to trust in his timing, to trust that he answers, to sit there night after night in the midst of your predicament, in the midst of the things that you could have never imagined and never would wish upon your worst enemy, to sit there night after night, late into the evening, searching and planning endlessly for a solution, wondering how this is going to work out. And this is surely what Hannah must have experienced. In the midst of her pain, she would no doubt endlessly question why she was barren. She must have wondered what she had deserved, what she had done to deserve it. And she must have wondered what can be done to remedy it. And there's no questioning, by the way, who the problem is. Because Penina was fertile as can be. So how long must Hannah take counsel in her soul and experience the anguish of this situation and search for a solution? Nothing can be done that she can do. And there's also this heightening in the experience of the psalmist from simply taking counsel in his soul. It actually goes from bad to worse. The lamenter turns the situation over and over in their mind. It turns to sorrow in their heart all the day. The more the psalmist thinks on his situation and looks for a solution, the more anguish that he feels, and the more this just bears down upon him. Darkness encompasses him in the, light of the, in the absence of the light of God's face and in the absence of a solution. And this is oftentimes the experience of those who are suffering. They turn it over and over and over again. They ruminate on it day and night. And the result of this is an overwhelming sense of sorrow and darkness that soaks and seeps into every waking moment. Like Hannah, perhaps we find ourselves in a position where we are no longer able to eat and no longer, uh, just no longer feel the basic desire or motivation for anything. I just want to stay in bed. And that's all that's left to us to sit on the ash heap and wonder how much longer our enemy, whatever this enemy may be, will stand in opposition over us. And so this leads to the psalmist's call, a desperate call from upon the ash heap, out of the turmoil and anguish of heart under darkness on account of God's covenant. Consider me and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Verse 3 and 4. So having invoked the covenant by questioning God's hiddenness, the psalmist now explicitly cries out to the Lord, begging begging and even beckoning and inviting God to respond. Here it might be said that the anguish they are experiencing is so overwhelming that they are on the brink of uh, of being able to withstand it any longer. The believer is expressing their sorrow has gotten so bad that they are in fact near to death. And so the picture here is a gradual glazing over the, in the, of the eyes as death approaches and one's life force begins to fade. I think many times, many of us share these emotions and feelings where our turmoil gets so bad that we almost feel that we cannot stand it any longer and we call out to God to answer us. Where like Hannah, we are in a place where we are nearly inconsolable Nothing sounds like much good to us, not even food. Nothing can be done to remedy the situation. 
perhaps that sleep of death might look like a sincere and, and, and strong desire to wash away our sorrows in sleep. I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to stay here in this death-like sleep. And there's great consequence, I think, to this kind of prevailing of the enemy over God's people. Now, again, we don't know the situation that the psalmist is in here, but what's presented is an enemy whose victory is nearly solidified such that they will stand over uh, the psalmist and rejoice over the psalmist's demise. They will be able to mock him whilst standing over the grave. So once again, we find a, a good example of this in Hannah and Penina. And I don't believe that the term is applicable only to those who might bear a sword against us in the context of battle, the term being enemy. But it's a figure that stands against the righteous, a figure who stands in opposition, whatever that figure may be. So in the case of Hannah, there's two figures, actually. First, it is her barrenness, and then because of her barrenness, it is Penina who takes the knife and twists it or pours salt in the wounds. Penina is here mocking and taunting the anguish of Hannah's barrenness, and she presents herself in opposition as an enemy. And yet, putting her plea in the context of the victory of her opponent presents a serious dilemma. The psalmist. If God does not help her from her enemy, she will be shaken. Now, the image here, this shaking, is that he, he or she would become undone at the hands of her enemies, undone in death. And so God has every reason to respond and answer swiftly when his saints get to this place. Here, his saint is a, a microcosm, a small example of a much greater battle, God versus the forces of evil. So the psalmist here bases his request for God's answer on the ultimate destruction of himself and on his enemy's victory and subsequent gloating over him. So if the ambassador and the child of God is given over to death and is defeated by a gloating enemy, what's that say about God and his promise? So the situation of the redeemed in anguish calling upon God and upon the covenant as the basis for their deliverance becomes kind of like a trial by fire. Like that on Mount Carmel, for example, where God put to shame the prophets of Baal and blazing fire through his prophet Elijah and showed the other gods to be, what? Powerless. So through his saint then, God would, in effect, vindicate himself in delivering them from their enemy. And so, once again, this puts it into the context of the covenant. The great king must show himself true and powerful to conquer his enemies and his subjects. A defeat of the subject is presented as a defeat of the great king. And that's the end of the plea. That's the end of the call. That's the end of the psalmist's confusion. Hmm. But we don't see the psalmist's deliverance here. In brutal honesty, the psalm does not endeavor to answer the question about whether or not the saint was delivered. Now, we can look at the plethora of examples in biblical history like the prophets of Baal, but that's not what this psalm does. He does not tell us what happened next, if God answered him and the rest of the story as many other psalms do. It does not really attempt either to justify or explain the suffering of the righteous. Those were questions I brought up because they're tensions I think that we feel. It does not explain why the psalmist is falling at the hands of their enemy and suffering at all, but it presents the psalmist's isolation from God in light of their situation as factual experience resulting from whatever it is that they are enduring. I am enduring this calamity where my enemy stands over for me, therefore God feels far from me. So through verse 4, this has been the operating principle. This has been the prevailing narrative. But verse 5 to 6, here we get the psalmist's consolation amidst their circumstance. What? This is an answer to everything that he's said thus far. It brings his heart peace from his calamity and feelings of abandonment. And this is, I think, what faith looks like in the context of calamity 
in the context of the everyday of experiences of life in an evil world. This is, I think, what faith looks like in a world of sin where things aren't as they should be. There's a simplicity to it. We don't get any reason for the change in tune, the change in pace, or the change in tone from lament and panic to comfort, confidence, and trust. There's no indication that the psalmist has been delivered from his predicament in this psalm. There's just a swift change from one line to the next. The inner thought in prayer life, the lament of the psalmist, is therefore, I think, a wonderful model for us. And sometimes I think it's appropriate to say there are experiences in life that are just so earth-shattering, just so gut-wrenching, that you don't know what else to pray other than, God, where are you? And that's all you can get out. Lord, where are you? I believe. This isn't Psalm 73. We witness the psalmist working through their pain until they remember the covenant faithfulness of God and their deliverance in him despite the vexation of their suffering. So the lesson is we don't have to accept overly facile explanations for the suffering of the righteous. We don't just plug our experiences into, in like a calculator like Job's friends and conclude that the psalmist must have done something wrong. We don't undermine the sovereignty of God over all things in order to justify either the presence of calamity. And in affirming his power and control over all things, in affirming his covenant promise to bless us, we don't undermine his covenant faithfulness or his justice and assert that he is the author of our calamity and the author of sin. But we also don't shy away from lamentation because the answer to these questions is hard. Answers to tough questions simply aren't as simple as simple in a simple way Answers to tough questions simply aren't as simple in a sinful world where we can't plug the variables of our life in like a calculator for an explanation. That's it. The righteous suffer, but God is faithful. The righteous suffer, but God God feels far, but he is near. He is sovereign. He is just and he is working all things together for our good. And the, the lamenter holds all of these things together in tandem. What we can do is represented in this psalm, especially in its simplicity. It moves from a cry of abandonment to a call for help to a statement of com- confidence. And the simplicity of the solution is rep- represented even in the fact that the psalm moves from longer and longer phrases to shorter and shorter declarations more short and simple expressions of his thought. From the complexity of our thought life, obsessively and endlessly turning over options and various solutions, the psalmist rests in the simple conclusion that does not answer every single question he might have. He finds peace in the steadfast covenant love of the Lord who delivers and has dealt bountifully with us. It's a simple solution expressed in simplicity in contrast to the longer phrases in the rest of the psalm. As such, the psalm moves from a slow to a slow crescendo with its conclusion. What's left after all of this thought, all of this endless searching, is not more answers and more questions that quell every anxiety. It's not even the representation of present deliverance in an answer to his call. After all of this thought, after all of this confusion, more panic won't do. Instead, the consolation, the comfort, the joy of the psalmist that he experiences is found in one quiet resolution. God is the faithful God of his salvation who has blessed him abundantly even in the face of his circumstances. God is faithful despite the vexation and confusion of calamity. God is faithful despite what feels like his absence, even in this present world of broken clocks. 
I really do believe, brothers and sisters, that this psalm does not shy away from the complexity of life in its conclusion. It does not endeavor to answer the hardest questions, to defend God's justice in, being, in feeling far and appearing far from the saint and allowing them to suffer. And this is why I think this psalm is a wonderful example of what the proper lament is like. In our modern world, quote, there seems to be a discomfort with negative emotions, and even when a song includes a cry, it is not from a place of desperation. The need has already been met, and so the lament is grayed out. I think we need to be able to, as God's people, be in a place where we can issue forth these short cries of abandonment without seeing a solution in the present, as our psalmist does. We need to be okay without seeing every question answered and still rest in the faithfulness of a covenant faithful God who has saved and who has been and continues to abundantly bless us. So pain can often feel too uncomfortable for us to express to pause, to endure, but without that lingering reflection, that anguish remains unvoiced in the ears of him who hears our cries. We don't live in an age of dominating triumph. We live in an age of triumph and death, and to assert otherwise is an overrealized perception of the kingdom of God as it's unfolding in the present. So it's not blasphemy to lament, to question, where God is and how long he will make us wait. It's not blind faith to lament and then rest in his covenant faithfulness. To rest in our faithful God and his deliverance and the saving acts he has done in the past. I think that's what Christianity is all about, isn't it? So we read that we proclaim his death until he comes. Turning to God through lament without having immediate answers as we wait for his return is one of the deepest and most valuable expressions of faith in God. It doesn't shy away from the hard questions, but it faces them boldly and rests in his power. In the end, I think we learn the simplicity of taking these prayers to God and resting in his covenant faithfulness and resting in the evidence of his saving act in the past. And this prayerful lament is better than silence. It's important, especially for those of you who are young in the faith. Silence is blind faith. It ignores the realities of suffering and the complexities of life in an age where things aren't as they should be. The converse position is silent despair, blind faith where we jump to Romans 8 and the promises of God's provision without really wrestling with why his promises don't really seem to measure up with our present experience. And the result is a people who can't lament, who can't deal with suffering, who can't ask why, and ultimately who can't rest in the fact that God is faithful and sovereign and just despite what we see. A people who stop praying because life just doesn't make sense a people who haven't learned to rest in God's covenant faithfulness to provide in his own way at his own time. And if we jump to deliverance and provision without teaching people to lament while they wait and that they'll have to lament, the result is a people who are disillusioned by their suffering. Instead of wrestling with God's hiddenness and the calamity they experience and finding consolation out of his faithfulness and saving acts in Christ Jesus, they walk away. This psalm teaches us that we don't always get the answer that we can see now, but we do get an answer in the God who is faithful and who has been faithful. And the beautiful thing that we get to ruminate on far more than the psalmist did, is that we have a bit more redemptive history to look back on, don't we? We know, ultimately speaking, that for those who trust in the covenant faithful God, the triumph of the enemy mocking over God's anointed one over his grave is not the end of the story, and it doesn't mean that God has failed to keep his promise. We look back at the great king, Christ, who came and suffered as the lamenter, 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We look back at the great king who cried out and lamented in his real significant abandonment as one whose enemies mocked him while he was on that cross. And we look back at the great king who had to face, who had to face the turned face of God, not away, but toward him in covenant judgment. And we look back at the one who, despite being handed over to death, triumphed over death and showed to us the full extent of God's covenant faithfulness and the full extent of his commitment to save and deliver his people. And that act is the greatest assurance that we have of God's capacity and commitment to save us, to deliver us, to provide for us, to turn his face toward us. So we proclaim that death until he comes in the midst of our calamitous, anguishing circumstances where God feels far from us. And here in this place, in word and in sacrament, he promises to be near, to save to the uttermost, to incline his ear toward you, to shine his face upon you, and to pronounce upon you as you go out into this world his blessing upon you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness, for your steadfast love and mercy, for your covenant faithfulness to to the ends of the earth. Inasmuch as you may feel far from us, Father, in this dim-lit world, we ask that the light of your face would now shine upon us and that we would always trust in your covenant faithfulness and in your commitment to save. For we ask it in the name of that Savior who demonstrates this for us, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.